Okay, good morning, everyone. And uh, we're going to continue this study. This, uh, I've drawn out this line here that we're going to look at in, in a minute, but let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for the time that we have to study together. And we're thankful for the work that you've been doing in our lives and understanding these things. We know our understanding is incomplete and we need you uh, every day, every hour, every moment. And uh, we know, Lord, that many of us have um, experienced trials and suffering, uh, but we know, Lord, that there's a purpose in it. It helps us depend upon you. And it's also a witness to those around us of our faith. And so we pray, Lord, that you can continue to use us to your glory, that you can help us to be faithful um, in these trying times. Be with us now through thy spirit as we open your word together. It is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So good morning again, everyone. Now, what I have here is just the drawing that we had drawn on the board um, at the beginning of the study uh, yesterday. So we, we ended up with two different drawings. And um, so this one here just uh, deals with this period of 18 years, both the prophetic period of 18 years, which is going to extend from 9-11 to one year past uh, when time setting began in this movement. So we have 6-9-2018 is when time setting began. Um, that's the date that's marked with Jeff's prayer closing the Sabbath. And then this 18 years brings us to uh, 6-9-2019. Uh, um, but the actual years, and I guess get to move this a little bit, uh, is going to bring us to September 11th, 2019, and that's going to be 18 years, obviously, from 2001. And that's going to be um, the closing of the doors of Lambert Church. Now, we can see then that this line here, this 666 days, uh, is going to go from the sermon called The Closed Door on March 27th, 2019. So Jeff gives this presentation, and then four days later follows the camp meeting. I'm just going to zoom in for some people here, depending on the device they're looking at. So then you're going to have this camp meeting, and that's eight days from March 31st to April 7th, and then on April 8th, 2019, Jeff retires, and there's 153 days inclusive to when Jeff awakens. And that's going to be September 7th, 2019. And then there's four days uh, to the closing of the doors of Lambert Church. So we can see that this, um, this closed door message here to the closing of the door of Lambert Church are connected. Right? So his retirement and his awakening are connected. And this, this symbol from Samuel Snow's letters, which is a symbol of the closed door, because it's going to point uh, from his writing of his first letter to the publication of his fourth letter on July 18th, 1844. And July 18th typifies October 22nd, which is the 187th day of the Jewish year. And so we can see that the closed door is connected to this. And then the four days, and I didn't put that in here, but there's the four, four days between the closed door meeting and this camp meeting where Jeff is going to um, pass the torch or pass the cloak to Parminder. And, and then we're going to have the four days after Jeff awakes to the closing of the door of Lambert Church. So I probably should put that in there. I'm just going to copy this. Um, so July 18th to January 13th and 21. So, yeah, so that is, which I didn't put in here. But we, we have other diagrams with that um, dealing with the, so that's just commenting on the chat there. So I'm just going to put this number four here. It's just a, another thought. Okay. Um, we, 
Okay, so Jeff's last presentation was on the first day of the first month. Okay, so his last then, presentation, yeah. So that's and then his, uh, uh, here. Yeah. yeah. And so he awakens on September the 7th, which is the sixth day of the sixth month. Yeah. Uh, we, know, we know that's 153 days inclusive. Yeah. But as um, if you just do the math with the like the symbol, the prophetically aspect, you know, you say for six months and six days. So six months is 180 days, and then six days is 186. So okay. you have there maybe like a type of a symbol from the first day of the first month to the tenth day of the seventh month, and it's sort of a there's a numeric connection there you could maybe put it into that. Okay, so uh, if I follow you correctly, so you're saying, so Jeff, his last sermon, and that's going to be, uh, that sermon is going to be called 2019-2021. Uh, no, no, this one, that was the other one. Yes. Uh, that one's going to be 2019-2021. Yes, so that's from the first day of the first month. And that's going to be the first day of the first month. So here, I'll just put it in here, first day. Right, and and so the idea is that from the first day of the first month to the sixth day of the sixth month, the sixth day of the sixth month is, is the 153rd day of the year. Right, that's what you're saying. Yes. But Always. Yeah. You know what? Like 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 the way we did with the tenth day of the seventh month. Yeah. It's uh, seven months times thirty. Yeah. You know you have like so that was a, we got a symbol of a that's two ten plus the ten days is two twenty. Yeah. So we we had that symbol there. So I'm sort of doing that same thing with the sixth day, the sixth month. So it ends up being one eighty six. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so do people follow that? So you're just taking six times thirty is one eighty, and then you're you're taking that six. Uh, I did this, so that's the six months. You would multiply that. That's one eighty, and then the six days. That's going to be added to one eighty, so you get one eighty six as a symbol, not literally one eighty six, but one eighty six as a symbol. So this also, if we go back into Samuel Snow's letters then, even though it's not on the sixth day of the sixth month, we can see if we took the 153rd day of the year, it as a symbol, so 153 actually relates to 186, which is the cardinal count from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. Okay, so hopefully people follow that. Um, but we can see here this closing of the doors in the four days to the camp meeting. And then from when Jeff awakes to the four days to the closing of Lambert Church, that connects these. And then 490 days from 9-11-19 brings us to the School of the Prophets being put up for sale on January 13th. And, and then we have the eight days here. Um, to the sale of the School of the Prophets. And that's going to be 666 days from the closed door sermon. Now, we also have the 666 days from uh, 130666 on the mind calendar, which is the day prior to the closed door. Uh, that's March 26th to uh, Joseph Biden's inauguration. So, that's going to be one day before the sale of the School of the Prophets occurs. Now, what do we make of that? This, this connection here, what is this telling us, I guess, about these 666 days? I mean, one thing you could say is that there's church and state connected. And it's connected to a symbol of the Sunday law.
Any other thoughts on this? I was thinking that since Lambert means uh, bright land or brilliant land, it had something to do with the, the closing or the ending of the USA. It was like a, a foretaste of it. Okay. So it has some connection with uh, the promised land. Now, I always thought it was interesting that Tess Lambert happened to have that na last name because we had the Lambert Church and we had Tess Lambert. And, and it's called the Lambert Church because it's actually in the area of Lambert. That's the area, community, uh, where the church was. Um, so I thought there was some interesting symbols in that um, because this is connected with the closing of the message of Parminder, right? So we know Parminder's message is all tied up in this and Tess is part of that. So with the Lambert Church closing, uh, it, would, it would connect with that in some way. I mean, there's different ways it could be interpreted, but definitely we know that Parminder's that 18 years in which this persecution, this oppression occurs. Um, that's the whole point there is that Jephthah rises up in connection with that. And that's going to be the message of July 18th. Right. So we know, obviously, uh, with Jeff awakening and the closing of Lambert Church, uh, we move to the School of the Prophets. So so we know that Lambert Church, the doors close. The meetings are now going to move to the School of the Prophets. Well, they had. Um, so the next Sabbath. So Jeff awakes on a Sabbath there. And the next Sabbath is going to be at the School of the Prophets. And then we have these 490 days where the School of Prophets is put up for sale. And then eight days later, it's sold. So this shows this transition from the Lambert Church to the School of the Prophets. But both of these end. Both of these, this is the, even though this is the end of Parminder's mes message, in some way it's also connected to the end of FFA. And, and why would that be? I mean, and this is an incomplete line. This is just line is just a part of other things, but this is the line of um, part of the line we have with the story of Jephthah. Well, I think FFA being closed parallels the Ark being moved from Arkansas to what we're doing to our to our our studies now. Okay, yeah, because this is. Uh, the Philistine, um, it, it's paralleling the Philistine oppression, right? So this that's an, another part of our study that we ended up getting into as we started to look at this history. So we have this work in Arkansas, but we know also that <coughs> there's this review of this history that we see in Judges. So, so let us go there and we'll try to pick this up because we were, we were dealing with the ark. So you're bringing us back to that study that we finished off. So that was going to be the second drawing, which I haven't drawn out yet. Um, but we did two drawings yesterday and, and the other one's still behind me on the board. Now, um, I was reading over 1 Samuel chapter 5, 6, and 7. And uh, what we found is that the ark is going to be taken by, um, and, and we're going to take these 300 years. So remember, we have the 300 years that Ellen White says the ark was in um, um, Shiloh, right? So the ark's in Shiloh. It's going to be captured by the Philistines. And so... One of the things we tried to, to sort out is when did the Ark um, end up in Shiloh in, in our line symbolically. We know when it occurred. 
And so what we ended up with was this, well, I'll, I'll go there. No, I don't have the drawing. I do have my... So if we just go here. All right, so we have this here. And so you can see um, it's in reverse on mine, which is annoying. Um, so we can see here we went all the way, way back to 11.989. So we're going to go back to the 777 days. And that's going to be symbolic of the 2520. Right. So the 777 days symbolizes the 2520. And then that 300 years is going to be 30 years. So when I draw this out, it'll be nice and neat. And I'll add some of that. And that's going to bring us to the end of the 18 years. Now, one of the things that we had uh, done in this movement with the 30 and the 18, uh, what's left over? 30 minus 18. 12. Okay, 12. Now, obviously here we're not dealing with literally um, 18 years when, when we're, we're looking at this. Um, because we're going to 9-11. But if we look at 9-11, I guess, if we go back from 1989 to 9-11, that's 12 years, right? So we are we are dealing with these 18 years in the other drawing that I had. So the 12 years represents what? 9-11 what, what, is 12 years after 1989, and what does it symbolize? Beyond the disciples? Well, no, we're not dealing with the disciples because the time of the end is the birth of Christ, right? Christ is 30 years old when he becomes a priest. So when he's 12 years old, what is 9-11 lining up with? His first Passover in, right. front, of the, uh, in front of the priests. Right, so the first Passover. So we've already marked this before. So, so we can see that if we're going to take these 300 years to represent 30 years, and it talks about these 18 years, which we've already marked at 9-11, then we would say that the 12 years, that that's marking 9-11 as a Passover, the first Passover of Christ. Does that make sense to people? I mean, Jeff presented this before, so... So what does that mean if we look at 9-11 as Christ's first Passover? Dwight kind of touched on it a little bit. Well, wouldn't it be that the those that are receiving the message are now coming to the Passover, are coming to accept the Passover? Okay, well, it, it's just in this this line that we have of this movement. We have have nine eleven, right? As twelve years, and that that's a change in in the message in the ministry, right? So nineteen eighty nine is the time of the end. That's the birth of Christ, and then we have this twelve years that go to go to. Um, uh, 9 11 and we we already mark 9 and 11 as the fir first day of the first month but we know it's also uh, a symbol of the passover right so so we give both symbols to it because it's christ's first passover there's other reasons um but it is a change in christ's ministry because he's just a child before yeah he's a a little kid now he's he's in a different stage of life and the movement changes at that point too
Yeah, because the the movement starts to be substantially more aware of what's going on. Right. So and and the church also is bypassed. At right. Nowhere. Right. So Christ now he takes up a certain stage of his ministry, which is which is still a growing in the development stage until he becomes 30, right? And of course, Parminder and Tess use this idea that at 9-11 or 11-9, I mean, 2019, that the church was now um, mature, that they were going to be have this organization. They had they had tied everything up into that interpretation of that message. Right. So they had taken this interpretation of the message and uh, misused it. Right. So it's it's a, a false false interpretations based upon truth. Um, but we know that it's not, um, it's not complete, right? There's, there's, they're picking and choosing. So when we take all of the information and put it together and we can see that Parminder's message is a false message as is Tess's message, but it has elements of truth and those elements of truth make it attractive but also it buries those elements of truth. It makes them um, less likely to be accepted. So people end up rejecting the whole message because there was par partial error. So um, anyway, the 12 years there is important um, because it, it connects to these 18. So that, that, that witnesses to the other chart that we had lo were looking at before. But now looking at this one, uh, we can see that we have 1989. So we have the 30 years and we have the seven, seven, seven days at the beginning, at the end. So they witness to the 2520 as a symbol. And then we have um, 911. So, you know, we could put there that, you know, we could put the 12 and the 13 or the 12 and the 18 in here if we wanted to. But then we have four years and we went to the ozone uh, camp meeting in Arkansas. And that goes from November 7th to no November 14th. So I didn't put this on, on the diagram. So I'm going to just go over there and draw this. The diagram looks pretty slanted. Uh, So when we get to this ozone here, so I'm just going to put here, this is 12 years, right, from here to here. Um, obviously not to the day, but it's still 12 years. And then you have these four years. So when you get this ozone, that's going to be November uh, 7th to 14th. So ozone, Arkansas. And so we're going to say that here, the arc is going to move to Shiloh. So this is, so Arkansas ends up being Shiloh. But then it's going to be captured by the Philistines. So this is going to be Jeff's retirement. And there's seven months going to um, the closing of the door of Lambert Church, right? Or no, this is, pardon me, this is, uh, this is, this is November 9th, 2019. So this is the point where uh, Parminder's group has closed their probation. So just say Parminder's probation closed. Okay, makes sense. Yes. Okay, and but but this is the time that the Ark is captured by the Philistines. So Parminder's message has this period of time in which it has the Ark. Now, when it's going to be um, sent back, it happens in a process. Right. So the first thing they do is they put this cart on uh, uh, the, uh, or the ark on a cart with these um, 
milch kind, as it says in the King James. These are 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 cows. Yeah. Cows. yeah. So they're 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 cows that have had calves, and their calves obviously are bleeding as the mothers uh, mother calves go cows go away, but they don't go back to their their calves. So that's a miracle, right? That they don't do that. Also put. Yeah. So also that, put the golden mice. Also put the golden mice in there too. Yeah, and the emeralds, which are just basically copies of the boils or the pestilence that they received. So they make them out of gold. Yeah. So the emeralds, the hemorrhoids. Is that what they are? They're hemorrhoids. Okay. Yes. Okay. So they got. Are you sure they're not? They're just hemorrhoids, or they're not uh, any other type of thing? No, that's that's kind of what I've taken from from what I've read. Okay. Okay, because <clears throat> the word emerald means a mound. Right. So I took it as some kind of boil on them, but whatever it is, it, it they definitely weren't happy about it all. Um, and then the mice, the infestation of the mice. So they make golden images of these, five of each, I believe, right? Okay. If I remember from, from what I read. Um, so then they're going to go to Beth Shemesh. That's the house of the sun. And it's going to be uh, at the time of wheat harvest that this occurs. And it's going to end up in Joshua, the Beth Shemite, Beth Shemite's house. Okay, so I'm not sure what all these symbols mean here at this point. Um, and then we're it's going to end up... Um, in the house of Aminadab, and Eliezer is going to be the one who over, oversees this. Right, and it's going to stay there. And, and this is, is this still in Beth Shemesh, or is this where? Where is this? Anybody know? Did anybody look this up? I didn't get to chapter 7. I got chapter 5 and 6. I think, anyway, at this point, one of the things we can see is that this period of 777 days, when it's completed, this would have to do somehow with this transition of the arc. That is, I don't think it all just happens here, that this has something to do with it. Because there's a process in which it goes through. Um, just one question. In this ozone cap meeting, how, how old is Jeff? Because remember, this is 2004. I think he's 63, just turning. Yeah, okay. So in 2000... Oh, I'm not sure. Or 53. Well, in 2004, 53. how old was Jeff in 2016? Well, he is born in 51, so we'd be 53. No zone. So he's 53 here, okay. It depends, it depends on the year, either 53 or 52. Depends when in the year. If it was in the, if ozone was after November 7th, he would be 53. Well, it was November 7th to 14th, so he turns 53 years old at the beginning of that camp meeting. It's on his 53rd birthday. Okay. So... I just, yeah. Okay, that's that's what I thought. Because he turned sixty-five in two thousand. Uh, 
Let me see. 2016, right? So, okay. So, that, so he's born in 51. So 53 years old. Okay. Uh, that's just a little detail I wanted to add. Because this is his birthday, right? November 7th. So we have the Ark in Arkansas. And that's in Shiloh. That represents the 300 years. So this, this 300 years isn't going to represent, um, you know, 30 years like this, this 300 years does. So this, this is um, using this symbol, but it's, it's using it differently. And it's going to focus upon this seven months, and we can see the seven months fit in with the time that the Philistines have the Ark. And then we have these 777 days. So, so that's what we want to study is the end of this and see how this all fits together. Okay. So when we look at um, 1 Samuel chapter, uh, so that whole episode is going to be chapter 5, 6, and 7. The Philistines take the ark. The ark is returned to Israel. And then um, just at the, there we're going to have uh, where it ends up in the house of Aminadab in the hill. And they sanctified Eleazar, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. And so the ark abode in Kirjath Jerem. That's where it ends up. That was time was long, for it was 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So we know it's going to be 20 years in Kirjath Jerem um, until what happens. So where does the ark go from there? Is that what it's saying? The ark is in Kirjath Jim for 20 years. It would seem to be. Okay. So what's going to cause, where is it going to go from Kirjath Jim and what event is going to mark it? Because I, I haven't studied that part yet. I mean, we know Samuel. It, yeah. Does it not stay there until um, the event? Yeah, that's what yeah. I so this doesn't seem to fit in, um, right? So that, after twenty years, after twenty years, Samuel becomes a judge. Okay, so I think the ark is the, the ark still same, stays in the same place. Okay, so it just it was twenty years. All the house lamented after the Lord, and then Samuel judges Israel. That, so that's how we look at the 20 years thing. So the ark's still going to be there until David moves it. Is that 20 years marking, strictly marking, when Samuel becomes a judge? Well, that's what Stephen's saying. Okay. So and that's what he puts up into his uh, his chronology. So then we got Samuel being uh, made a judge. Now, is that is that equivalent with Samuel being thirty at the time that he becomes a judge? I would think he'll be about 35. Okay. Roughly. We don't know for sure. But right. He he'll he'll be all I think he'll be older than thirty. Okay. Because he's 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 twelve when he um I think when he gets that prophecy to speak okay. to lie. 
So, okay. uh, so maybe, and then he's going to, uh, it's going to be another few years before that prophecy is fulfilled. So probably about 35, I think. Okay. Okay. So, so we know that, that Eli is, um, It is obviously uh, going to be here just uh, um, so this is going to be well actually chapter 4 the Philistines capture the ark and that's going to be the death of Eli so, right. so how long after Samuel started working for Eli that this occurred we don't know right well if if the way that, that Stephen is approaching is correct uh the prophecy would have been given and it could have been either three or three and a half years after Samuel's prophecy to Eli that Eli dies. But we don't know exactly. Right. right. So, so we're just taking it that way. Just, well, and we don't, and we have here that Eli was 98 years old. We don't have any other indication of, of his age at any other event. So we just know when he dies. He's 98. And then, so Stephen is saying that Samuel's going to be about 15. Now, he doesn't become a judge, though, right? But I'm not sure what that means particularly. Just uh, so, with Eli, we know Eli becomes a judge when he's 58. Because he's a judge for forty years. Okay. So. Um, but that doesn't tell yeah. us anything about how old in these uh, these other events. No, no. Not no. Really attaching any event to that. Okay. And then we know, of course, you know, Eli's died, and it's going to be the ark's going to be with the Philistines for seven months, and then it's going to be twenty years after that that Samuel becomes judge. Is how we we address that, right? Okay, and and him becoming judge. I mean, I don't know why he doesn't become judge earlier. Well, so I don't. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us all the details of what's going on. How old? I mean, as we go through this, the Levites could begin serving at twenty five. Is that correct? Or did they have to wait until they were 30? I think 30. I don't know. Maybe someone else knows specifically. Yeah, I, I think uh, Levites are 25 and priests are 30. Okay, so okay. So then that's the case. I mean, I've heard something about it, but I, I wasn't really sure what the 25 was about. Okay, so 25 and 30 are the two ages then. Um, but he's going to be about 35 that Samuel becomes a judge. And, and that's going to be calling the people to repentance, right, to turn back to God. And so that's going to be 20 years after the ark had been returned to Kirjath Jiren. That would seem to fit. Okay. So, so in addressing this period of the arc, so when we, here, I'm just going to go back to this, uh, uh, to the whiteboard here. So I have to, change the camera so so when we look at this here this this idea of the ark um and then it's going to be returned and then samuel's going to be judged 20 years later how would we fit that into this i mean obviously this um is this is in a sense two different lines i mean we have this i mean it's not what we're looking at in in Judges chapter nine, 10, nine and ten, and so or ten, eleven and twelve. 
So we're not really looking at the story in Judges, but we're taking uh, this history then from, from the Ark because of the 300 years in Judges 11. And that represents 30 years. Now we can look at the Ark itself. So, so they're related, but they're completely different stories, right? Right. So, so when we look at this chart, um, and we think about how this is fitting in. So we know that Arkansas has this. So, I mean, this we could probably study this when we study uh, Sam, but uh, we probably will. But we're looking at it now. And if we're going to take the 20, uh, the 20 years, um, what symbol is that? And how would we fit this in? So the Philistines, you have the seven months, and then we're going to have this ark returning. It's first going to go to Beth Shemesh during the time of the wheat harvest, which is May, June. Um, and then, um, and then it's going to go to the house of Aminadab in Kirjath Jerim. And so what would that represent? And then this 20 years, do we fit that in anywhere in this, or we just leave it here? We just deal with the end of this. Are we going to look at Samuel and the 20 years in connection with these lines? I know I'm asking a pretty open-ended, broad question. Because, you know, we're stepping outside of judges here to do this, right? Right. Really a line from the judges itself. Okay, now from the chat, Angela had posted the verses that yeah. discuss that the Levites needed to be 30 years old in order to serve. So in order to serve then, Samuel, even though he had been ordained of God, had to be 30 in order to be able to, to serve accordingly at the temple. So here he is, you know, possibly 35 years old, in agreement with what Stephen was saying, at the time that he becomes judge over Israel. So we know we have this window. Um, it's interesting because, as you were pointing out earlier, we have this 12 years but now with Samuel, we also have a 12 and we have the 18. Right? Yep. So the reverse of 18 would be 81. So this would be a, a midnight situation. If we follow with what uh, with what Jeff had, had presented before. Mm hmm. Impossibly. Um, now here, just this is uh, this is the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, different ways of looking at it. the top one is based on Ellen White's three hundred year statement as being three hundred years exactly. So there you can see we have uh, in, the Ark's in Gilgal for seven years, right? So that's um, representative of the 2520 and then you have the 300 years that's the time that uh, the ark is in Shiloh and then Philistia has it for seven months and at the end of that you're going to have it's going to be in 
uh, Joshua, the Beth, Beth Shemites to the house of Aminadab. That's going to happen at the end here. I don't know why I put that here, but at the end of the seven months. And then 20 years, and that's going to mark uh, Samuel becoming uh, a judge. And it's 153 years to the laying of the foundation of the temple. And then seven years to the dedication of the temple. Um, so there is uh, 69 years to Saul. And so if you took that 69 years and you looked at the 20 years, that's going to be 89 years um, there. But we're going to say that Samuel is going to be 35 here in 1166 BC. That would seem to be correct. So if you're going to look at Samuel's age. 104. Yeah, 104, when Saul is anointed. Right. And then Samuel's going to live how long after that? At least. Would that mean that he would live... An, almost another 40 years? No. Okay. No, he's not he, He's not around when Saul's brain ends. That's why I said almost. No, I mean, he's gone long before then. But when is, when is David anointed? Isn't he anointed about 20 years into Saul's reign? I don't know. Stephen, do you have any insight into that? Well, uh, we can know that David was born when uh, Saul was ruling for 10 years. Yeah. So we could say that David was maybe anointed initially by Samuel when he was 17, maybe. We don't know for sure. Yeah. So that would be uh, 27 years into Saul's reign. Okay. And then uh, it becomes part of Saul's household and the fugitive. And then it's uh, while he's a fugitive. So maybe another 30 years, I'd say, from when Saul was anointed, Samuel lived roughly. Yeah. So 30 years. So so he'd be 134 in this chronology. I think above, yeah, probably. Maybe, I think I had even guessed around We've had older not maybe at like 137 or something. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay um, I'm not sure. Now, now when Ellen White makes, sometimes she makes statements about periods of time, and we know that they're not exact. You know, she talks about periods of 500 years that we know are a lot more than 500 years. Um. So she makes this statement of 300 years, and we're just taking this as if it is 300 years. We don't know for certain, right? So it's possible that it's more than 300 years, but she just rounds it down. So, but if we take it literally, this is the chronology we would have. So you would have um, Sam being about 137 years old when he dies. Now, I have another one below there, but that one doesn't really make much sense either because I have uh, Samuel becoming um, judge 20 years, um, so about the time Saul is anointed. But, um, so I would think that, you know, it's possible that it's somewhere between these two extremes. This would be the extreme of it. But we have no way of knowing for certain that Ellen White's not rounding down from a bigger number. But still, as a symbol, uh, we can use it, even if even if we don't know the exact time. Okay, so so this is this is part of the problem dealing with this chronology. Um, now. 
Now, part of it, Stephen, is you had worked out all these different judges. Could you fit the judges into that 300 year period that Ellen White gives? Um, not really, no. Not no. all of them. Okay, so, so it is possible she's rounding down. Would you agree with that? Well, that is possible. We don't, yeah. I mean, because she does it other although, times. Although so. we think with some, some of them judges we understand are overlapping. Yeah, I know, but we have to get them all to fit. I mean, we can't just overlap them willy-nilly just to fit into some other statement, right? We need to have ways of doing that. Um. But yeah, so part of the, you know, part of the problem that people have when um, you have the 480 years, for instance, to try to fit the judges in there is, is rather difficult if you're taking it from uh, the Exodus itself, right? So if you're going to take the 480 years from 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, where... Um, and that's going to be, for some reason, it should be the laying of the foundation of the temple over here. Sorry about that. I don't know why I did that. Okay, so um, this might even be wrong. But anyway, um, so if you, if you um, take this 480 years, and, and you make it to the Exodus, that puts 440 years. Um, in that period, right? And, and you can't fit the judges into that whole period of time. So that 480 years isn't correct there. But you understand what I'm saying? People that we have these period of the judges and it needs to fit into this period of time. And, and that's gonna be basically 396 years, but it would be 356 years if you take the 480 year statement as going back to the Exodus itself. So, so if we're going to take that 300 years, that makes it even more difficult. That makes it pretty difficult to fit that 300 year statement that you're going to have the judges that we study that you're going to fit them in there, but then you're going to give Samuel this much longer period. And unfortunately it doesn't tell us how old Samuel was when he dies. So, so we don't have any, any chronological statements that I know of where we could tie that together. So, so I'm of the opinion that the 300 years is, is rounded down. And I, I don't think that does injustice to the spirit of prophecy because she does it other times. Uh, she tends to use round numbers, but not always. Well, I was already saying that uh, Samuel was of good age already uh, when the Saul was being anointed. Right. You know, and then uh, we know that there was other people, such as uh, the one that looked after Joash. He was 130, so that was maybe another 200 years after that. And then uh, for the chronology to fit, with the, the lineage of David. So he was his father, Jesse, and then his father was Obed, and then his father was, um, was it Boaz? Yeah. And stuff. So each, each of them would have had to be living, or actually had them as, as, their, as, their, as their son. They would have to be, we could be very old to be a father. You know, yeah. They'd have to be nearly 100 years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not saying it's impossible. 
I'm just saying it because I'm not really basing this on Sam's age so much. I'm basing this upon the judges that have to fit in the 300 years. Right. So we have enough detailed analysis of how we would fit that together. But it just seems to me it's kind of hard to fit them all into a 300 year period. So, but, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's important that we know exactly how that all works. I'm just saying that if, if Ellen White is rounding down, you know, even by 30 years or something or 20 years, um, that's not a problem. It just means that we can't figure out the exact years in which these events occurred. But, you know, Samuel still can be pretty old when he dies. Okay. So I, I don't I don't know the solution to this problem. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna go back to Judges chapter eleven. And so I don't think at this point we can um, I don't think at this point that we can we can start taking the 20 years and placing it from Samuel in the line that we have behind me. I think what we can do is we can uh, bring us to, to the story of Jephthah as being this message of July 18, and particularly dealing with the 777 days. So, I mean, we did a bit of a diversion there uh, because of these 300 years. Um, and this isn't the 300 years of the ark, but we looked at the 300 years of the ark so that we could understand um, a bit more about our history. But that's something we're going to have to look into detail more later. But we can see how it fits in, fits in with the things that we've been studying. So, so there is a connection between this 300 years and the 300 years that Ellen White mentions. Even though it's not specifically marked in the Bible regarding the 300 years of the ark, Ellen White marks it at least as a symbol. And we can then fit it into this structure dealing with this transition um, from Parminder's group having this message and this message being transitioned into the message present. He would, uh, you know, do that. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so that makes sense. Do people kind of agree what we've done here? I mean, it's been a little bit of a diversion into into the story of the ark, but, but do, do we see that it fits? It looks to be logical. Yeah, because because we already even without the story of the ark. We can still take these 300 years and make them the 30 years, and we can still do um, much of what we we had done uh, earlier, right, in, in the day uh, yesterday in the first diagram. But now when we take the story of the arc, we see how it fits in um, with that. So it fits in with that history. And so I think we pretty much have to accept uh, the diagram on the whiteboard behind me that it's that that would be correct because it's going to cover the same history just in a different way. Okay, so so we did that because I wanted to go into Jephthah's tragic vow, and and so we're going to read this now and then decide. How we're going to address this. Okay, then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, 
when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands, and he smote them from Aurora, even till thou come to Minith, even twenty cities, and unto the plain of the vineyards with a very great slaughter. And the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house. And behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances. And she was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one, one of them that trouble me. For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. And she said unto him, Father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. For as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months, that I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. And he said, go. And he sent her away for two months. And she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. It came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed, and she knew no man, and it was a custom in Israel. But the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. So what was, what's the problem with this whole Jephthah's tragic vow? What, what is this about? Because we looked at this before in quite a bit of detail. And we struggled with it. Was Jephthah being kind of rash? Okay. Um, I mean, doesn't Ellen White say it was a rash vow? I'd have to go back and look. Okay. So... Um, I'm just checking here if I can find a statement. Okay, I don't have anything where she puts the word rash. I'm going to look at vow. So she mentions Jephthah seven times. Most of those are repeats. Yeah. Yeah, so she just takes that one statement uh, from... Hebrews. So she doesn't say anything. And then she has the one where a deliverer was raised up in the person of Jephthah, who made war upon the Ammonites and effectually destroyed their power. For 18 years at this time, Israel had suffered under the oppression of her foes. Yet again, the lesson taught by suffering was forgotten. So she doesn't say anything about the vow. So I'm thinking of something else where there's a rash vow. But anyway, uh, and I don't know. I mean, this is a vow that he makes um, that he's going to offer something to the Lord um, if he's victorious. I mean, is that a right or wrong thing to do? Was he really considering what could happen when he's making this vow? Well, he doesn't appear to be.
So any any thoughts about this? I mean, I know we looked at it. Um, nobody remembers? I remember going through it. I just don't remember all the details. Okay. So when we dealt with it was in the beginning of September. Didn't uh, we, didn't we, I'm sorry, didn't we um, discuss it? Did it wasn't a, actually, he didn't sa really sacrifice it. He just gave it to the Lord. Well, that, that was to me not really the point. I mean, uh, and I'm not sure whether we, we all, agreed on that exactly i mean the idea is that he offers this vow now i tried to say that this has something to do with nashville okay and so and, and i kept asking people because i'm looking over some of the meetings you know did people have any uh make any sense out of it and I can't remember exactly how we looked at it. Um, so, you know, part of it is my memory is faulty here on this as well. But when we take this vow, I, I mean, I would relate it somewhat to um, the Nashville prediction. But is there good reason for me to do that? I mean, what, what symbols do we have here? We know that this, this message of Jephthah is the message of July 18th. This is a tragic vow. So it's a vow that's made. And now when we think of a vow, so if we look up this word here, um, So where does it say he made the vow? The vow to vow. So this word, Nadar, is to promise. So he's going to promise. Um, it also refers to uh, the act of promising and to the thing promised itself. So it's a verb as well as a noun. 5087 is the verb. 5088 is the noun. So how, how could we relate this to July 18? And, and then remember, with this vow, he's going to defeat um, the enemy here. And, and the enemy is who? Again, it's it's Ammon, right? Right. Now, when, when we apply this here, we're saying that this is... Um, this is basically the message or the influence of Parminder's message that has affected the message, right? Okay. And so we use July 18th as the way that he is defeated. But because this is the message of July 18th, but does the message of July 18th have a tragic vow attached to it? It's got, it's got a disappointment. Definitely has a disappointment, right? Now, if this daughter, who could the daughter represent? The movement. Okay, the movement. Okay. Is the movement sacrificed because of the prediction of Nashville? Yes. Okay. And we can see that. I mean, that that would seem, I think, pretty obvious. But we were expecting this this vindication. 
but instead what we see is a sacrifice. And would that represent what happened with the Nashville prediction? I would think that it would. Yeah, okay. Now, so one of the things about the Nashville prediction, um, I mean, it is of God. So it was right for us to predict um, that Nashville was going to be attacked by Islam based on how God had led us. But it doesn't mean that we that we were right about the event. Just because we were right in giving the warning to Nashville. Um, we had this date, July 18th. And we didn't fully understand our lines. So just as the Millerites didn't fully understand their line, when they were looking for the second coming of Christ on October 22nd, 1844, it doesn't mean that they were wrong in giving that warning. Right? Correct. Yeah. And yet people will say, well, because we failed, um, we had this disappointment, then, you know, we are wrong, but the Millerites were right, which made no sense to me. Because we should have expected, based upon our line, that we would have a disappointment. So to me, the disappointment might be that it came to pass. That's what I was thinking the disappointment might be. But I also knew that it might be that it wouldn't occur, which to me personally wouldn't be a disappointment. But um, it is going to occur at some point. So is, is that all we can do with this? We can take this story of Jephthah and we can take this uh, failure of July 18th as representing this tragic vow. And that the daughter that sacrificed is FFA itself. It would fit. Yeah, and it, it definitely would fit in with what we have in the lines because in when we're dealing with the story of Jephthah, it's going to address the end of the school of the prophets, right? That's what we have here. So maybe the daughter is the school of the prophets itself, right? So if we look at this here, I mean, this comes from the story of Jephthah and it's going to, and, and maybe the tragic vow, you know, could be a bit more complicated than that. Um, you know, we could even say um, that it's connected with that whole history that we see here. Uh, the camp meeting where he hands the reins over to Parminder uh, um, and all those things that occur at the end of this 18 years. Um, up to the closing of the Lambert Church's doors. And then, of course, tied with that is the prediction of July 18th in there. We don't have it drawn in. But then it ends with the sale of the School of the Prophets. But this is prior to, you know, the first part is prior to July 18th, right? So if we're going to put July 18th in here, because <clears throat> you got September 11th, 2019, so I'm, I'm just taking this and uh, doing this here. So over here, you're going to have July 18. Somewhere in here. Now, where is it exactly? So we could probably figure this out. Because this is September 11th, 2019. How many days is that before November 9th, 2019? Like 61 days? No. Or six or 59 days, 60 days. What is it? Um, Should be 59 days. Okay, so 59 days. If you add 59 to 252. Three eleven. 
So 311. Okay. So if you have 311 to July 18, what's 311 symbolize? That should be an easy one. Half of, Half of 622. 622, right? Because in Samuel Snow's uh, letters, right, he has that uh, Pentecost letter, which is written on the day of Pentecost, the sixth day of the third month. It's published five days later on the 11th day of the third month. And the day it was written was June 22. And when it's published, it's published on a biblical date that when doubled becomes 622. So 311 represents 622. It represents the, the symbol for FFA, right? Because 622 is the date that Jeff chose. So June 22nd. Yeah, June 22nd, 622, June 22nd. So June 22nd, 2011, he gets that 60, 6, 1,600. Uh, yeah. 159000 is that? Yeah, $165,000, right? Okay. And then, and then, uh, and then it's going to be three years later in 2014 that they have the first camp meeting in Arkansas, you know, not counting the ozone ones. And then you're going to have um, three more years to the center of the 777 chiasm, June 22nd. And then we have June 22nd, 2020 as well. Uh, that's going to be the date in which... Uh, the July 18, 2020 prediction is becomes international news, right? It's published on the 21st, but it becomes international the next day. And that's going to be 187 days to uh, January 6, 2021. So... So anyway, we're going to, so we, if we have this 319 or 311 days in here, uh, can we see that this, these events here uh, are going to lead to July 18? Because this, in a sense, is the tragic vow that relates to uh, the defeating of the enemy and then, uh, the prediction of July 18, because basically he has to have the enemy to de defeat. Does this make sense to people, what, what I'm saying? I'm not saying it very well, so. All of it tracks. Okay. It all seems to fit. Yeah, so, so the July 18, the, the tragic vow isn't just the prediction of Nashville, but it's the things that lead to it, which begins with Jeff um, putting Parminder in charge. It would begin with that. Because Jeff retiring and him awaking, um, and then the closing of the doors of Lambert Church, uh, these all lend to, end to the, lead to the end of FFA. So when Jeff does this closed door presentation on March 27, 2019, he's starting a series of events that are going to lead to the end of the School of the Prophets. And, and we can connect this to the Ark, right? Because we can take the story of Eli and, and line it up with Jeff. And the Ark being taken by the Philistines as well also fits into that history. But that's, that's a different history, but it still lines up with this. So, so that's really the end of FFA, the sale of the School of the Prophets. And, and in a sense, it's a closed door as well, because once they've sold it, they have no more access to that building, right? Right. So they still could have used it, but they passed the keys over to the new owners. 
So, I, I mean, I think this is a pretty neat and tidy uh, analysis of this chronology in comparing it to the story of Jephthah. I just think it fits, but I don't see that we, I can't find fault with it. Of course, you know, I'm partly it's put together, but by me, but you can see this, this, this just fits. I mean, it's, there's too much here to just say, well, we're subjectively, you know, creating this line. There's too many um, witnesses in this chronology. Okay, so so are we settled then where the tragic vow is, that it's just part of that diagram? It can work. Okay. Now, then the next part that we get into put on a line is the conflict with Ephraim. And that seems to be pretty simple as well, because we went through this before. Um. So this is, is an internal conf conflict within the movement, right? Within the movement or with the church? No, well, this is with, within the movement. Okay. The men of Ephraim here has to do with the movement. This is all about the movement. This is the history of the judges is this movement from 9-11 to 2023. Right. I'm just, I'm asking questions just because. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But we looked at this before of ha having to do within the movement. So this is a strife that's going to arise within the movement. Now, we already had tra the tragic vow of Jephthah. And we know where it's going to lead. It's going to lead to the close of the School of the Prophets, to its sale, to basically the end of FFA. Um, but now we have... Uh, this other illustration of this history. And so this is where we're going to pick up uh, tomorrow. Okay. And, and if we understand this as this internal conflict, we can see how this internal conflict has continued um, in this part of our history of the movement. So this has to do with the message of July 18th and how it's treated, uh, particularly after its failure. So that's how we understood it before. Um, and so we're going to look at uh, a bunch of this stuff here of what, what the, how this relates. So any final questions before we close with prayer? Not for me right now. Okay. And, and I'll try to get that diagram, diagram drawn up um, a little bit better, the one behind me on the board. And, um, and then we should be able to find, uh, there are keys here in the story of the conflict with uh, Ephraim that should be able to help us um, understand where to put this on the line. You know, we have that shibboleth and the sibboleth. We dealt with that before. And so we should be able to we should be able to put this into a line as well. Okay. <laughs> Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time we've had here this morning. We know that there's Still many things that we do not fully understand. And we just pray, Lord, that you can help us in our personal study as we go over these things uh, to be corrected where we are in error. And um, we pray for each person today that you can watch over them, that you can guide them, and that they can trust in you. We ask, Lord, that you can use us to your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.